the Wednesday night Bible study. We're glad that you've joined us and uh, on this cold day, and I, I thank you for that. I welcome you, and I want you to know that we're glad you're here with us, and um, I know everybody's busy getting ready for Christmas. It won't be long now. Got excited little children and grandbabies and frazzled mamas and daddies, but um, the Lord is good, and we are blessed, and I just want you to know that I thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Pastor Hardy's been on a mission today with, with one of our church people at a hospital, and he's busy today, but um, we're going to uh, talk about the Word in a little bit. We're going to talk about matters of the heart, and I just ask you to get your Bible, sit down on your couch, gather your family around, and let's just study the Word together, but before we do that, let me also um, just remind you that there will be a screen available if you want to go ahead and give your tithes or your offering tonight. That information will be on the screens for you. We appreciate all that you do to help us and um, all that you give, you know, goes out and blesses people all over the world. And I'm so thankful for that. We are blessed to be a part of uh, churches in lots of places that we may never go, people that we may never meet. But uh, one day, one day when we stand before the Lord, I believe he will allow us to see uh, people that maybe we've spoken into and never even met them. But I'm thankful for that. So just watch on the screen for that. But I want us to pray. There's still lots of sickness around. There's people this week um, dealing with death and I just ask that you continue to pray. We've got some people who've had surgery this week and in the hospital. I know Miss Joyce's brother passed away. You may not be aware of that. And um, just got lots of needs. So I just ask you to pray with me before we get into our Bible study tonight. Father, we do love you. We are just grateful to come into your presence and to come into your house. And I thank you right now for every man, woman, boy and girl who may be listening with us tonight, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help me to speak what we all need to hear, O oh Lord. I know you've uh, touched my heart as I was studying, preparing for this, Lord, so I pray that you would continue to, to touch people tonight. Lord, I thank you that we have this opportunity and the ability to go into people's homes with your word and share the gospel and study together, Lord. Father, we do pray, as I said, there's many that are sick tonight. Uh, I lift them up and ask you to touch and heal and deliver. Father, I just pray that um, people would enjoy your presence and would be aware of you, Holy Spirit, that we would allow you to be ever, ever so real in our hearts and in our everyday walk, oh God. I love you, Father, and I want you to know that I'm grateful for what you are doing, those things that we See, and maybe things that we don't even realize, oh God, but you're faithfully working in all of our lives, and I thank you for that tonight. Have your way, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As I said, we're going to talk about matters of the heart tonight, and if you've got your Bible, we're going to be several places, but the very first scripture I want to read is in Proverbs, it's chapter 4, and you've probably all studied this or know this, but it simply says this. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Another translation says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Now, I want us to notice that it does not say, you know, the preacher will guard your heart, or your husband, or your wife, or even God. It says, You've got to guard your heart. So that's a task that you and I need to um, be aware of and endeavor to do every single day and, and I, I want us to understand why because all throughout our day anything and everything can come against us can happen offenses may come people may say things not even on purpose but uh, may say something that would wound your heart and and we've got to uh, be so in tune with the Holy Spirit that that we've got that guard right there that we we know he's for us and that he loves us and and we've got to be able to forgive we've got to be able to let go of bitterness or anger or strife or hurt or whatever it may be but the Bible just says guard your heart and and we're going to look at several scriptures tonight, and I realize that this, this may be a little bit hard uh, when, we, when we look at what we're going to, these scriptures that we're going to talk about, but I think that the Lord has us here for a reason. I know that he does. 
Um, I don't know what you may be dealing with tonight. I don't know what may be going on in your heart or in your home or uh, situations around you, but I know that the Lord has us here for a purpose, and I want us all to examine ourselves, examine where we are, what our walk is like, what is my conversation like, what is my Bible study and my prayer time like. Um, there's so much that, that tries to distract and so many things that gather our attention all throughout the day that we've got to be careful that we don't leave the Lord out of every single thing that we do. And that is all part of guarding our heart. And I want us to remind, uh, remind us that um, if you'll turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Samuel, and I've debated back and forth of whether I want to read all of this scripture because it's kind of lengthy or if I just want to relay the story. But I actually think that for it to have its best impact on all of us, I'm going to read it. So please bear with me and follow along if you will. We all know this story. It's the story of David and Bathsheba. But I want us to, to allow the Lord to really get this down in our hearts to make us aware that we are no better than David. You know, David is described as a man after God's own heart. And we know that David loved the Lord. I know that I love the Lord tonight. And I know that many, many, many of you that I know personally, you know the Lord too. But none of us are above falling into sin. And if we don't guard our hearts, these very similar or same situations could happen with us. And that's what I want us to avoid, every single one of us. So listen as I read this. And I'm going to start in um, 2 Samuel Chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring when the kings marched out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he said, Isn't this Bathsheba? daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hethite, David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had just been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Afterwards she returned home. The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. David sent orders to Joab, send me Uriah the Hethite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the troops were doing and how the war was going. Then he said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the palace with all his master servants. He did not go down to his house. When it was reported to David that Uriah didn't go home, David questioned Uriah, haven't you just come from a journey? Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered David, The ark, Israel, and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my house to eat, to drink, and to sleep with my wife? As surely as you live and by your life, I will not do this. Stay here today also, David said to Uriah, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next And then David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him, and David got him drunk. He went out in the evening to lie down on his cot and his master's servants, but he did not go home. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Put Uriah at the front of the fiercest fighting, then withdraw from him so that he is struck down and dies. How sad is that? When Joab was besieging the city, he put Uriah in the place where he knew the best enemy soldiers were. Then the men of the city came out and attacked Joab, and some of the men from David's soldiers fell in the battle. Uriah the Hethite also died. Joab said someone sent someone to report to David all the details of the battle. He commanded the messenger, When you finish telling the king all the details of the battle, if the king's anger gets stirred up and he asks you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you realize they would shoot from the top of the wall? At Thebes, who struck Abimelech's son of Jerebosheth, didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the top of the wall so that he died? Why did you get so close to the wall? 
Then say, your servant Uriah, the Hethite, is dead also. Then the messenger left. When he arrived, he reported to David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger reported to David, the men gained the advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we counteracted right up to the entrance of the city gate. However, the archers shot down on your servants from the top of the wall, and some of the king's servants died. Your servant Uriah the Hethite is also dead. David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this matter upset you. Because the sword devours all alike. Intensify your fight against the city and demolish it. Encourage him. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah had died, she mourned for him. When the time of mourning ended, David had brought her to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. However, the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. Now, I know that's a lot of Scripture, and I'm not done yet. We're going to read some more in a few minutes. But I want us to just kind of recap what has happened here. Remember I said a few minutes ago that David is known as the man after God's own heart. But in this story, we see that he fell into a place of sin. He fell into a place where lust literally consumed him. And when the lust became so consuming to him that he brought Bathsheba to his home. He had sex with her. She became pregnant. And then, rather than falling on his face and asking the Lord to forgive him for this great wrong that he had done, he continues to spiral down deeper and deeper into sin. And it's so deep and it's so ugly and so terrible that he ends up committing murder. And... It's just an awful, awful situation. And we see that the Lord was not at all pleased with this evil. And that's when I want us to go on into chapter 12. And let let me read you just a little bit more. So the last verse said, However the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. Don't we all consider that to be evil? Absolutely. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. Now Nathan is a prophet. He sent him to David, and when he arrived, he said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised her, and she grew up with him and with his children. From his meager food she would eat, from his cup she would drink, and in his arms she would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. Doesn't that just hurt your heart? David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. I want you to hear that. David, out of his own mouth, said, The man who did this deserves to die. Because he has done this thing and shown no pity, he must pay four lambs for that lamb. Nathan then replied to David, You are the man. Now, can you just imagine the humiliation, the shame, the guilt, the hurt, Every bit, every emotion that David had to feel when Nathan said, you're the one who is guilty. You're the one who I'm speaking of. I, you know, he, he had he'd told this little uh, limerick. He had told this little tale, this little story. But in it, he said, you're the man. You're the one who took what did not belong to him. You're the one who killed. You're the one who murdered. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. Why then? Why? See, that's a question we've all got to ask when we find ourselves in a place that we don't need to be, doing what we don't need to be doing, saying what we don't need to be saying. Why? Why? Why then have you despised the Lord's command by doing what I consider evil? You struck down Uriah the Hethite with the sword and took his wife as your own wife, 
You murdered him with an Ammonite sword. Now, therefore, the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on you from your own family. Listen to that. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes, and he will sleep with them in broad daylight. In other words, shame on top of shame on top of shame, hurt, humiliation, destruction, devastation, everything wretched and foul and ugly and hurtful, it's coming your way because you have done this great sin and you've hidden it and you've compounded it by acting as though it was all right. Mm. You acted in secret. Listen to this. You acted in secret, but I will do this before all Israel and in broad daylight. Isn't it amazing that we try so hard to hide our sin? We hide our ugliness. We hide our ugly thoughts, our ugly ways. You know, we can hide them from our spouse. We hide them from our fellow church members in this house. We can hide things from. But the, the truth of the matter is this. I don't have, care how good we are at hiding things. The Lord knows it all. He sees what we do in secret. And in, uh, in one of the verses, David said, even though I've done this in the, the, the deepest of darkness, it wasn't dark to you. The Lord sees. The Lord sees, and he sees everything that you and I say. He sees our actions. He sees the intents and the ugliness in our heart. We act like everything is fine, and yet in our heart we can be enraged, enraged on the inside. But God knows. And, and the good thing is that even in the middle of all of this mess, God was still merciful to David. We're, we're not finished yet. We, we, we saw David said that man deserves to die. And in true reality, according to the law, he did deserve to die. But out of the graciousness and goodness of our Lord, he, he didn't allow him to die. The baby died and the sword never did leave from David's house. His, his children were against one another. His children were against him. One of his sons raped the sister. It's, it was just so filled with sin. But do you understand that that's why the word says that you and I have to guard our hearts? The very same thing. Oh, I, I can hear somebody right now. Oh, that I wouldn't do that. I would never allow myself to stoop to that. Do we, do we think that David got up that night when he was walking around on the rooftop, did he realize then where it was going to lead? Did he wake up early that morning saying, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plot to kill Uriah. I'm going to steal his wife. I'm going to have a baby in, in a sin. He didn't do that. Nobody in their right mind does that kind of thing. But sin comes when you and I are weak. Temptation comes and lust comes. And if you and I don't deal with it very, very quickly, it will take us down a path that we don't want to walk on. And it will steal our walk with the Lord. It will steal our very heart that is supposed to be filled with love and consumed with the goodness of our Lord. And if we don't guard our heart, We'll find ourselves, maybe not in this same situation, God forbid, but we may find ourselves in a place that we don't want to be. So I'm saying to us today, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the, the stern warning from the Lord that says, guard your heart. Don't be lazy concerning your prayer time. Don't be lazy concerning reading this word. Don't be lazy concerning loving the Lord. Don't be lazy when temptation comes and you think, oh, I can do it this one time. No, don't do it this one time. Realize that this one time will lead to another time, to another time, and another time until we get so deep in a place that we don't even know how to get out. David didn't know. David didn't realize that he had totally obliterated his walk with the Father until Nathan came and pointed that finger in his face and said, you're the man. But thank God, thank God, David heard what he said. And I, I want to go ahead and read um, Psalm 51, because this is David's prayer. 
concerning what Nathan the prophet had brought to him. And I want you to hear this. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Have you ever cried that out to the Lord when you realize how sinful and wretched you and I can be? David said, have mercy on me, Lord, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Now, as I read this, I want you in your mind to be thinking of the sin he's talking about. He's talking about the lust, the sexual sin, the murder that he committed of Uriah, all the deceiving, all the convoluted lies, all the, the trying to get Uriah drunk. Every, every bit of that was sin. Blot out my stains of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Have you ever felt so guilty before? Have you ever felt, been so guilty that you felt shameful over yourself? Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. That's when your sleepless nights come into play, when you're haunted by the rebellion and ugliness. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. In other words, I deserve whatever I get, Lord. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Somebody needs to pray that right now. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep me looking at my sins, or don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right or loyal spirit within me. That's a scripture that we hear so often. Create in me a clean heart. We're talking about matters of the heart. Where, where's your heart tonight? Father, I ask that you create in each and every one of us a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal and a right spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. That's a large statement right there. Make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. I looked at that and sealed my lips, and I got to thinking, I'm sure that he was so ashamed of himself and so guilt-written and so humiliated by his own actions that he probably wasn't even able to speak. He probably wasn't even able to talk to the Lord. He probably wasn't even able to convey his heart to the Lord. So he says, unseal my lips, Lord, that I may praise you again. Take me back to that place. Take me back to that place where I used to walk with you. Take me back to that place where before, before this happened, take me back to that place where I was able to feel your presence. And please, remember where he said, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Let me ask us a question. I, I've thought about this today. I cannot even imagine living one day without the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. Can you? I want to ask you that. I want to ask you. Um, and there's, there's a lot that goes into that. You say, well, the Holy Spirit is always with us, and he is. The, Jesus is with us. Once we ask him to come into our hearts, he's always with us. But doesn't mean that, that we make him a part of our everyday life. Doesn't mean that we walk and talk with him every day. Doesn't mean that we allow him to put his input into the decisions that you and I make. He wants to do that. He wants to be that. And I, I want to remind us tonight that in our busyness and in the chaos and in the, the, the COVID mess that, debacle that we still all find ourselves in, it's more important today than I believe ever before that you and I ask, not allow, I almost said allow, but that we ask and invite and encourage and beg the Holy Spirit to come help us. We need him. 
And I believe, or actually I know this to be the truth, had David been walking right with the Lord like he should have been, number one, he wouldn't have even been at home. He should have been out on the battlefield with all of his soldiers is where he should have been. He wouldn't have been on that palace rooftop that night if he'd been where he ought to have been. But see, you know the old saying, hindsight's twenty twenty, And I'm sure if David had his time to go over, he never would have done that. But some of us today, we've got the opportunity. You're hearing me speak right now. So when the temptation comes to you again that you've been dibbling and dabbling with that you shouldn't be doing, when it comes again, you don't have an excuse. You don't have an excuse to, to fall into that. I, I want us tonight, I want us, I, I beg you tonight to ask the Lord to search your heart, to search your heart and, and, and reveal the matters of your heart, whether they be good or whether they be bad. You, you and you and God alone know what your heart condition is. We've all heard Joyce Meyer speak about uh, as a young girl, all that she went through and the abuse and the sexual abuse and all those things that happened to her. And I hear her say this over and over again. And she said, there were reasons in that that if I had held on to that all of my life, they would have been an excuse for me to have never moved forward. See, there's a difference between a reason and an excuse. There's reasons for things that go on, but you and I cannot allow it to be our excuse to hold us in a place. Many of us, many of you maybe have been abused, maybe are in a, a horrific situation even right now. Don't let that become your excuse because the Lord for you and I, as he did for David, he will make a way of escape for us. That's the Bible. That's what the word teaches us. He loves us so much. Now, let me ask you this. I, I said all this, and we saw God's mercy in David's life. We, we saw that there was hardship, but he didn't kill him like he could have. He didn't cause him to die. And he still used that man in great and mighty, mighty ways, writing the Psalms and writing the Scriptures and speaking into our lives. Now, let me ask you, does God love David more than he loves you? Does God love David more than he loves me? The answer to that is no. The answer is no. The answer is this. God loves David, God loves you, and God loves me. And there is where you and I can find life and life more abundantly today. There is where when we do search our hearts and we look in, into the depths of who we are and we see ugly and we see things that disappoint us, we see things that we know God is not pleased with, it's at that moment when guilt tries to rise up or shame or condemnation and, and says all these things that God will never use you or God won't ever forgive you of that. See, that's where the lie comes from. And that's what I want to dispel tonight because the fact of the matter is this. God loves you so much that Jesus came to break all of that sin, past, present, and future. He, he's, he's paid the price for every bit of it. And he wants us clean. He wants us whole. He wants the, the world that we live in that is so crazy and chaotic and sinful. He wants somebody that you deal with to see Jesus in you. He wants people to see that even though we may have been wretched and ugly and a mess and hell bound, that's not who we are anymore. All because of the goodness of Jesus Christ. See, all of that are matters of the heart. All of that is matters that you and I have to take account of and, and, and look at and, and just realize that God loves us and God always makes a way for us. You know, the Bible says in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? My heart is deceitful and your heart is deceitful. But God is greater than the deceitfulness of our hearts. God was greater than the deceitfulness of David. God was greater than the, the, the sin that he committed. And God is greater today than any and every sin that you and I can commit. The blood of Jesus is able to wash us and cleanse us and change us and turn us around and bring our homes back together. If your home is a mess and there's bickering and arguing and, and strife and stress and all those things, the Lord says, let me come in. He's standing at the door knocking, just knocking and knocking and knocking. 
Will you let him in tonight? Will you let him in to come make a difference in you because you can't do it yourself? Will you let him in? Will you let him come and, and just show you you? That may be an ugly picture, right? Sometimes when the Lord shows me me, oh, my goodness, it's so ugly. But yet he does it in love, and he does it not to condemn, not to humiliate, not to bring shame. He does it to let us see that we don't have to stay that way. He, he does it to let us see that he's the answer and the only answer that can get us out of the, our mess. He's knocking on your heart tonight and saying, please, let me come and make a difference. Let me come. Let me come. There are several other scriptures I wanted to read to you, one of them being in Psalm 139, verse 17. Again, this is David. How precious are your thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I could count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hated them, or I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies because they're your enemies. Now listen to this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Will you allow the Lord to search your heart tonight? Will you? He, he already knows your thoughts. He knows every bit of it anyway. Even though we've tried to hide, I said that before, you can't hide from him. David said, if I go down to the very bottom of the sea, you're going to be there. If I climb to the top of Mount Everest, you're going to be there. So will you just allow him to search your heart tonight? I, as I'm speaking this to you, I'm hearing it, and it's so simple to me. And, and I have to ask us this question, why in the world would we run away from that kind of invitation? Why would we say no to that? Why would we say, let's wait till another day? Or why would we say, oh, I'm, I'm just fine right where I am, when we know we're not fine? When we know that we're miserable and we're wretched and we're sinful and we're, we're full of anger and hate, why would we run from the one who is able to set us free who says, come just like you are with all your trash, with all your junk, and I'm going to help you fix this. I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to turn your life around, and I'm going to give you joy. What did David say? Give me my joy back. Give me peace back. Give me hope. Renew, renew your right spirit within me, O Lord. That's what he's offering to every single one of us. You know, Christmas is coming. What, what better time than today to receive the greatest gift you will ever receive in your entire life? You know, there, um, some of the ladies and I were talking the other day, and someone had seen online a purse, now a, a pocketbook. Just picture this now. All of us ladies like purses and pocketbooks. And this purse was the emblem on the outside of it, is diamond encrusted and cost over $200,000. Now, that's a house. Just think about that. I would rather have Jesus than every single one of those purses known to man I, because that purse can't give me peace. That purse cannot give me hope. That purse can't take away my sins. That purse is not going to buy my entrance into heaven with the Lord one day. Only Jesus can do that. So no matter where your eyes are focused right now, be it on material things or, or, or whatever, just, just for right now, just, just for these next few minutes, bring your thoughts back in. Bring your heart back into the place of hearing the voice of the Father. You don't have to hear my voice. Hear the voice of the Lord speaking to you right now. What's he saying? What's the Lord saying to you right now? I often think of this. There's a song that says, what would you and I do 
if Jesus walked into this room? How would we reply? Would we fall at his feet? Would we shout, shout praises of exaltation? Would we fall on him? In a, what, I, don't, I don't have a clue what we do. If he literally walked into the room. But, but see, the thing that you've got to, to know and I've got to know, he's walking into this room right now. And he's here. So the question is, how are you going to respond to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? How are you going to respond? What are you going to say when he asks, can I come live in your heart? Can I come and wash your sins away? Can I come and help you deal with your anger and rejection? Can I, what are you going to say? I hope my prayer tonight is that you won't say no to him. My prayer tonight is that somebody listening, somebody who's hurting, somebody who's in trouble would say, Lord, you're just what I need. I've about come to the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. Didn't know where to go. Didn't know what I was going to do. But you're here, and I say yes to you. That would be my prayer for every single one of us. Um, I know that, that we know the Lord. I, I know that. But I know that temptations comes to every single one of us. In Matthew 22, it says this, and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy, what? Your heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I'm reminded of the scripture in Romans chapter 7 where Paul was saying, he said, those things that I know I'm supposed to do, I find myself not doing. And all those things that I know I don't need to be doing, that's what I find myself doing. But see, Paul was saying, and I'm saying, and the scripture saying, it's all about the heart. Sin comes, temptation comes, and Jesus comes with the answer. He doesn't ever say anywhere in his word, thank God that you and I have to be perfect to come into his presence. He comes to us when we're anything and everything but perfect. And he offers us life and life more abundantly and offers us the blood of Jesus to cleanse every single one of our sins. And he will help us just like he did with Paul when we see all those things that we get discombobulated in. I need to be doing this, but yet I'm doing that. I don't need to be doing this, but yet I find myself there. And he says, let me just help you with this. I ask you tonight to let the Lord help you with whatever you're dealing with, wherever you are, whatever brokenness may be attached to you, just ask the Lord to come and break that off of you so that you can live and you can love and your heart can be whole. And we say, I got a call this week to, to be a part of a, a funeral service, and it's for a five-year-old little girl. And the first thing that came out of my mouth was, oh, that breaks my heart. And then my mother called me, and a very, very dear friend of hers, husband, passed from COVID this week, and I said, oh, that just breaks my heart. And we say that, and I mean that, it does break my heart. When, when I think of the, the death of a, a five-year-old especially, because I've got little grandbabies that age, and I cannot even imagine what that mama and daddy are going through right now. But it breaks my heart. And, and what I want us to understand is my sinful actions and your sinful actions break the heart of our Father. And that's truth tonight. And I believe that the Lord wants things to break our heart because when our hearts are broken, that's when I find myself in front of him on my feet, I mean on my knees, in front of his feet on my knees, praying and asking for help and deliverance and hope and peace. I pray that that's where you'll be finding yourself tonight. I want to pray for you before we go home, before I go home. Um, Father, we love you. I thank you for your word. 
I thank you that you're patient and gentle and kind. I thank you, Lord, that you cleanse us over and over again, oh God. Lord, I thank you for every single person who's watched tonight or listened tonight. I pray for them in their homes or cars or wherever they may be. I pray for those who are broken tonight, those who are hurting tonight. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to just gently nudge their hearts, oh God. I know you're knocking on hearts even right now, asking will they allow you to come in and help them and be with them and live with them and walk with them, oh God. I thank you for that. You are so precious to me, Lord, and I thank you. I love you with all of my heart, and I thank you for this time together. Now bless your people, Lord, in ways that I don't even have a clue about, Lord. I ask you to bless them tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Again, I thank you for joining with us. God bless every single one of you.